alustab taskuhäeling, peavail. Räägime võitist teadlikult. It is pleasure to welcome you in our podcast, Peavail. This podcast brings experts together for discussions about development of Estonian football and its players. Today we have a special episode because it is recorded in English and our guests are from Switzerland. We are going to talk about training load and injuries. Discussion covers relation between these aspects and gives insight how to monitor training load in football. Also, we will talk about how well can we prevent injuries and what are practical suggestions for from our guests. My name is Silver Grauberg and today today's guests are Amit Salah and Michael Müller. Hello guys. Hi. Hello. Uh, so where do you know each other from? Uh, Amit and I were working together in Basel. He was there one year earlier, I think it was 2014. He came to Basel with uh, the head coach Paolo Sousa. And then despite winning the title, they changed the head coach after that. And then I came with the new head coach, um, Wolf Fischer, who is now in Berlin in the first Bundesliga. And uh, we were in Basel together for three and a half years. And uh, then Amit went on to eBay. I went on to Lucerne. And um, yeah. Okay, so you work together in Basel, yes? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, but uh, let's start the introduction from uh, Michael, uh, who is probably more familiar to our Estonian audience. Michael is uh, right now in uh, Estonian national team uh, and works there as a fitness coach. Before that, he has worked in clubs like uh, just mentioned FC Basel, uh, FC Luzern and uh, in Switzerland Olympic Sports Medicine Center. Michael, uh, in terms of managing training load, what is the most stupid thing or biggest mistake that you have seen in uh, your professional career? Um, I think it's a, it's a really good question because we're supposed to learn from our mistakes. So I, I have a, a long answer to that. Um, the first most stupid uh, thing is uh, from personal experience. Um, I've, I've been lucky and never had any major injuries, but you know, the injuries that I've had, they always occurred when I knew maybe I shouldn't play, maybe I shouldn't train. And I was tired when I was under high load and I thought, oh, something's going to happen. And one time, even, you know, I was hoping for an injury because then I, I would get out of uh, some other things and an injury happened as well. I sprained my ankle. So that's um, learning number one. Uh, trust yourself and, and, and listen to yourself. Um, the second thing that I came across is uh, during youth development, when you have young kids playing in different teams and um, the coaches not speaking to each other. And in the end, um, the kids who still go to school, they have uh, weeks with 80 hours of load from school, from training, from traveling to and from training. And they work more than uh, managers of international companies. So I think also there, um, a lot of times in, in the youth development, nobody has the overall load under control. Um, and the last one is, um, I think, uh, also something that I saw, and um, this is really funny, it's a video I saw on YouTube uh, from 2015 from uh, Bayern Munich. Um, they were doing um, injury prevention exercises before training. And uh, one player, uh, Frank uh, Ribery, uh, he stuck out, um, especially because he was only joking and making fun and not doing the exercises in the correct way. So I think is the last learning point is uh, when you plan a training, you also have to control how the training is executed. Hmm. Okay, very nice answer. So. Uh... Yeah, I like the part that you said uh, that the communication between the coaches to know the overall load. So everybody is doing their own thing and uh, in the end the player is a whole and uh, and we don't take this uh, into account. So uh, our second guest, Amit, uh, is actually born in uh, Israel 
and uh, had a player career uh, in there as well. After that, he moved to work as a physiotherapist in FC Basel, and now he's working with the Switzerland first division team, Young Boys. So, first of all, how did you get from being a player in Israel to uh, being a physiotherapist in Switzerland? Yeah, so, you know, the connection between football players and the physio is not so far away because physiotherapy is part of the normal days. And in, and even when you're not injured, you are like sitting around in the physio, speaking, talking. So I was I was quite uh, excited by the work of the physio, and I like I like the the person who worked there. And um, when I decided to quit my uh, football career, I said, yeah, I think physiotherapy could be a nice uh, nice profession for me. So, uh, yeah, so I went to school to study in the university. And then when I finished studying, uh, I find a job in Maccabi Tel Aviv in an uh, Israeli uh, football uh, football team. And the coach there was Paulo Sosa. And after one year, he uh, moved to Esther Basel and I kind of came with him. Okay, so with the head coach. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question for you uh, would be that... Uh, uh, what would be the biggest mistake that you have done as a physiotherapist in terms of managing training load and injuries? I guess um, when I was when I was a young physio, I didn't really understood the importance of the of the load. You know, I work with the injured players and I try to bring them to to the level of the team. And I didn't realize how much important it is to know the first the level of what the, the team is performing now and the uh, former uh, a level of the player that I rehabilitate, which, which, which level I need to bring him back to. So I guess to make a rehabilitation without knowing the, 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 the load that the player, once he's coming back to the team, will face, this, this might be the biggest mistake that I, uh, that I did. But, but now, now with, uh, with all the equipment and the measurements and uh, the data that we work with, it's much easier to uh, to detect where you are, where you want to go, or uh, it's very easy to, to plan. Hmm. Okay, okay. So the the need for the player who goes back to the team, uh, you misunderstood it. Exactly. The level of the, the let's say it like this: the level where I used to work and the level where the team was, the gap was too big. Hmm. Okay. So when he came back to the team, then it was the, the load was too high for him. And he got injured again or something like that. Uh luckily not, but uh <laughs> but this might might create a problem. Okay. So but let, uh, let's let's go to the topic itself. Uh, Michael, how would you define or describe what is training load? Um I think Training load is is defined by how long and how intense you you train, and you can um, speak about the training load of one day, of one week, of, of one period of, of training. Um, and it's 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 the load that you have to you have to overcome in training. So how many meters you run, but it's also the load that like the the, the effort that you have to create to participate in the training. So for example. If, if I run 10 kilometers um, for somebody who's trained well, this is not the same load like for somebody who is not trained as good. So it's also dependent on the, uh, on the training level of the athlete. Okay. Amit, you agree to that or? Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, but uh, how can we measure it, the training load? Um, so, yeah, uh, like I just said, there's a, um, different parameters that we can use. Uh, one very common parameter is training volume. So um, how many meters did we run or for um, what amount of time did we train? Was it 60 minutes? Was it 90 minutes? Did we play three times 10 minutes or did we play three times 15 minutes? Um, how many, um, w when you use a, a GPS system like the professional teams do, um, you can measure how many sprints we did, how much high speed distance we did, how many accelerations and decelerations we did. Um, this would be the external load of what you have to do. 
but then um, as well for two different players the same external load might not be the same load for the players or the same internal load so this you can measure with with heart rate and heart rate um, you have a maximum heart rate what your body is maximally capable of doing so for example i can my body can do 200 beats per minute and then if i if i do an exercise and my the intensity goes up to 160 beats per minute i know this is about um is it 70 percent maybe i do the math wrong of of the maximum effort mm -hmm. okay so uh you mentioned uh, already terms like internal and internal and external load. Uh, Amit, can you a little bit explain what what do you think what, for you? What are these terms? Uh, as Michi already said, it, there is like the external load. It correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Michi. It's more the acceleration, the the the, the accelerate and deceleration, all the parameters, the, the distance, the distances. This is something that um yeah you can you you can explain it better he's is much uh is the expert in this in this field and more uh, more work with the ria but if you want with more detail i think michi is the right uh, right person to ask yeah i think external we can define as everything that um where my uh, that i have to um do as an as an athlete uh, how many meters uh, for a cyclist, how high you, you climb, how many kilometers uh, you ride, um, what velocity do I have, what speed do I have. And then the internal load is what is my heart rate, what is my blood pressure, um, how much recovery time maybe do I need from, from a training. So what, what, um, what amount of energy do I have to invest to do a certain uh, load? That would be the internal load. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and how can we uh, measure the internal load? Uh, we can measure it directly via the heart rate, for example, because this is um, uh, an output of, of the body. It has to create the higher the heart rate, the higher the internal load. We can measure it in the urine. We can measure it in the blood after training, maybe. Um, there are certain enzymes that get produced uh, that can be a marker of how hard the training was. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if I don't have any of this equipment to measure the heart rate, measure the urine, everything like that. Yes, then you can you can simply ask the player on a scale of one to ten, how intense was the training for you today? And then maybe you know you have twenty players who did the same training, um, and then one player says, okay, today the load was a three out of ten, and for another player it was a seven out of ten. So also, this would be. Um, just a very subjective uh, measurement, but still it's a marker of the internal load that it can be easily done. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, from the external load, uh, you, you talked about GPS uh, uh, measurements already, like the acceleration, decelerations uh, and distance, but if I don't have it, what should I do? Then I think uh, you can use uh, a watch and just use the time as, as a measurement for external load. Um, so four times four minutes is more external load than four times two minutes. Um, also, you can use uh, the the area of the pitch depending on the on the size of the pitch. The load is, might be different. On a, on a smaller pitch, you have more accelerations and decelerations, and more collisions, more changing of of position. On on the larger field, you have more high distance uh, sprinting, more velocity. Okay, and which one has a higher external load? Uh like uh, smaller smaller pitch or the larger pitch so it, it's different categories of of external load i think so on the smaller pitch the external load of the accel accelerations and decelerations and collisions is higher and but on the on the larger pitch you have the high speed distance so it, it, it's a larger external load on the on the hamstrings for example, because you know you have large, uh, more more stride length, you make bigger steps. The hamstring goes more into the um, into length, so you have a different loading pattern. I mean, correct me if I'm if, if I'm wrong again, please. Uh, you're totally right. Yeah, when you have when you have a bigger space, then you can create much more uh, long long uh, long distance sprint, which can put the hamstring in in higher risk than you have a small spaces. 
when you cannot really um, that you then you are, have more load on the on the front chain on the on the knee that you have a lot of stop and go changing direction it's a little bit different but i i guess that um let's take like this if you have uh, 20 seconds or one minute of exercise on a big on a bigger uh, on a bigger pitch or a bigger space that i guess that the external load uh is much relative uh um lower compared to a, a smaller pitch in the same time in the same time yes absolutely so so if for example you have uh, you have a game four against four the bigger the pitch the, the lower will be the external loads on the on the neuromuscular uh, system of the player because they will have they will have much more space to each player to to, um, to to train or to move and there will not be like a lot of uh, acceleration deceleration okay so uh, to be clear on the terms again uh what is the intensity and the intensity will be will be less so in a game also in a game on a large pitch even if it's 11 against 11 you see players walking a lot of the time in a game four against four there's no breaks no players are walking or even standing can you explain it a little bit yeah so in intensity is the load you do over a specific time or the work you do within a specific time the more work you do Within the same time, the higher is the intensity. So for example, meters per minute is a marker of intensity. 100 meters per minute is more intense than 50 meters per minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the uh, other, uh, Amit uh, said, uh, neuromuscular load. Uh, how is it different from the training load? Or is it different? It's, uh, it's a part of it because Neuromuscular, it's like you have the neur neural system and you have the muscular system, okay? So the higher the intensity of the training, the higher the intensity of the on is on the uh, neuromuscular load of the player. So that means that the muscles are tired, the neural system is tired if the intensity is high. If you have a, let's say it like this, if you play um, 90 minutes or 20 minutes, where, when do you feel more tired? When the muscle needs more time to recover? 90 minutes exactly so the intensity is higher so uh, the intensity of the game or the of the of the training is higher so the intensity of the neuromuscular system is going up as well okay so basically they are connected and neuromuscular load is uh, mus muscular load plus the uh, neuro nervous system uh, load exactly this this combined is neuromuscular load exactly okay okay um, uh, uh, am I right if I say training load is uh, can be defined as intensity times the time you play uh, it's like uh, intensity is let's say hundred uh, percent let's say uh, five actions per minute and we play uh, five minutes in total and this uh, that way can we we can uh, uh, calculate the training load uh, but uh, how do we know what is uh, the intensity of our training is it is it uh, is it the way i said or some some way else if i don't have the measurements for that Let's say, is it uh, how how can I say how, how big is the intensity of the of the training? Uh, yes. So in in, in your example, uh, the five minutes would be the volume, and the five actions per minute would be the intensity. So the total training load would be five times five, twenty five, twenty five actions. That's the training load. And then if the intensity is ten actions per minute, you would have a training load of fifty because you have the same volume, the same duration, five minutes, but you have double the intensity, 10 actions per minute. And if you, um, the same, you can do really easily again with the numbering system from one to 10. If you train for 60 minutes and the intensity was five, then you can say, okay, today I have a training load of 300. And when you train for 60 minutes and the, uh, the um, intensity was only two, then you can say, okay, today I have a training load of 120. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, if we don't, uh, how how can I measure the actions? Like, uh, should I be with the paper on the sideways? 
making crosses every time an action is done or what what are the methods if i don't have any special equipment for that uh yes so it's uh you you have to see uh what parameters do you think are relevant for for your training and and what systems do you have so when you again when you have a gps system you can use accelerations or decelerations or sprint or collisions yeah let's um, say we don't have it yeah yeah then you can you can use um maybe how many shots how many crosses how many time like when you do uh, uh centers or sprints down the sideline um you can say okay you have a a, a 10 minute exercise and how many sprints did they do within that 10 many 10 minute exercise so there's you can create also your own uh, parameters. Okay. So I think it, it's good to keep it um, simple. So after training, you you have a, a quick overview. Ah, from the okay, I meet you. What to say? I think I agree with Michi. It's it's very difficult to uh, first to measure these things really precise when you don't have the right equipment. But in um, Let's, let's say that in semi-professional uh, clubs, when you have no other option, I guess what you can do, you can build a, a training, build the exercises, make the questionnaire of the intensity, subjective, subje subjective uh, uh, information. You need, first, you need to collect data. And then you will record this kind of training. And you know, okay, this part was quite tough for the players. Maybe I will use part of, of this uh, training, some session of this training, in another session, in another uh, in another day, and I do the same exercise, and I see how, and I ask them again, what is your, uh, what, what do you think, uh, how was the intensity, or how how tired you are, and then I can collect a little bit information about my training. If, for example, you make a exercise uh, a training, and the average uh, intensity is to be active by the players is seven, but you do, and then you do the same, uh, maybe the same exercises, but, uh, or one week after, and they tell you, hey seven still seven then you know okay this training is around in this kind of intensity mm. okay so this may be something that you can work with when you don't have really the equipment you need to work more and more with the with, also with the subjective but as i say it's very it's very difficult to to sit and calculate how many sprints if they are making uh, uh they're making games very difficult mm. to because Depends on position also. Central midfielder doesn't make the, the same distance as, as the winger, or he doesn't make uh, so many uh, a sprint as a winger. So the intensity of of each player should be in the perfect world individualized. Mm. Yeah, and the positions uh, count a lot. Yeah, uh, and uh, actually, uh, I have uh, I have this kind of situation in my team uh, in under twenty one FC Flora team uh, where I don't have the GPS system but I use it exactly the way that uh, you described here I collect data uh, from for the internal load uh, with the RPE scale 1 to 10 how difficult was the training and uh, the external load I have used this method that Michael uh, uh, described but uh, I found a way that if I videotape it then uh, after the training, I have time to like scroll through it with every player. Basically, uh, I can see that. Okay, uh, by 10, uh, 10, 10 minutes of uh, playing time, he did let's say twenty actions in total, and with every player, I, I can do it. Uh, but it's it takes time, and uh, then we have always the question that uh, how important is it that. Uh, we collect that data for every player every day, like that. My, in my opinion, it's very important. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, uh, most of it, it's very important to know what is the load in the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can uh, see that that way we can actually see the training intensity uh, moving uh, through the whole season. If we start the season and then we play seven against seven in uh, one type of field and then uh, they do like by five minutes they do let's say 100 actions for a team in total and in the end of the season they can do the same game uh, 120 actions in average then we can see the okay 
but uh, amit your uh, topic a little bit more we talked about tra- training loads and the uh, other part of the podcast is injuries uh, how are these two connected uh whew. or are they are they connected at all uh doch, yeah yeah they are, they are connected uh, very connected actually for this i need to uh, integrate also another another uh, another uh, parameter it's uh, there is a good load and chronic load good load it means that um, what is the load of this session today what is the load chronic load is you can see it how 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 is the how is the load during the week during the month so for example i give you or i mean uh, yeah. if i if i interrupt you quickly to to, to make it even easier the chronic load is like also the level of the athlete exactly so uh, an athlete who's on a good level who has played uh, many games who is uh, in the middle of the season has a high chronic load an athlete who comes uh, out of uh, vacation has a chronic load that's very low I can give you a simple example when you go to the gym and lift uh, 50 kilo every day you lift 50 kilo 50 kilo 50 kilo this is your chronic load you are you're in 50 kilo but when the day game come and you need to lift 100 kilo how the muscle how your muscle will cope with it not not very well i think so so th- this is the, this is your connection to to uh preventing injury and and the uh, and the training load mm-hmm. so but uh how does the injury occur then injuries occur there are several options uh, or uh, contact and this one you cannot really um uh, um i would say to prevent because yeah you are you're, it's not a single sport it's like you have another component uh, you have an uh, opponent that can um can crash you and think can uh, go bad or when the tissue is not uh, cope with the load of the of the training of the game of the of the intensity so when as I said, if you go back to this uh, example, if you use if your if your muscle are trained to lift 50 kilo and now they need to lift 100 kilo, then your mu- your muscle fibers are not strong uh, strong enough to to deal with it. And most of the injuries you can uh, they happen when you have or a sudden acceleration or deceleration. A more acute in this uh, I speak about muscle problems. Mm-hmm. Okay, but. Uh... Can you give us an uh, like an example about the mechanics behind, uh, let's say, hamstring uh, muscle tear? Or it's just uh, uh, that we're running, and at one point, it's uh, we feel that uh, yeah. the muscle is well, something happened there. While running, there is a there is different phase of the muscle muscle action and most of the problem happen in the eccentric phase of the muscle when the muscle contracts but elongates in the same time okay so it contracts but it goes longer exactly. at the same time yeah. exactly and then why that what happen when you open stride when you're sprinting when you swing the leg and the and and the body wants to stop the leg to li- leave it down then the, the the hamstring is try to control the knee in order to slow down the movement and this is the this is the eccentric uh, phase of the muscle. And this, when you are tired, when you are not fit, or when you um, didn't do, a, or when you are yeah um, overtrained, then the muscle cannot function uh, as it should, and then the problem starts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. But coming back to the injuries, uh, we see that they happen a lot. But uh, can we then uh, prevent these things happening? We can try uh, to prevent. It will be, uh, I think it will be too, uh, too optimistic to, to think that we really can prevent. We can try. We can try. And there are different, uh, now, you know, now the research uh, is very developed and, uh, and, ma- and there are many, uh, um, many aspects of uh, preventing injury. There is except of the load that we are all speak. There is the sleeping quality, there is the nutrition, there is the, um, yeah, the uh, um, rest during the day, plus um, working on the, on the tissue, on the mobility of the tissue, of the flexibility of the tissue, mobility of the joint, and strength, of course. There are many, many parameters that we can try to influence besides the, 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 the acute and chronic load. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the 
the biggest uh, issue is with the chronic load. I understand that uh, uh, if we uh, if we load always uh, too less, uh, too small on the player, and then he goes uh, like to playing phase uh, two games uh, two games per week, then he's uh, or she's uh, uh, body can't uh, tolerate the load. Am I correct or? Yeah, I think the the problem is um, if you have sudden jumps in, uh, in in the load. If if the chronic load is too low, and then you have a really high um, load, so a high acute load, you have really hard week or really hard two or three weeks, and then you have a problem. Um, or also, if the chronic load for a very long time has been too high, then also you will run into um, a problem. But I think what I what I um, would uh, like to add, what, what I think that um, you can do to help to prevent injuries from from a, a standpoint of from from the player is uh, you need to be able to to control your body. So first is you you have to train yourself to prepare for the demands of the game. So that means you have to bring up the your load, your your level, and uh, you have to know uh, to be able to perform all the all of the movements that are required um, in the game, and, and this you can you can train. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but uh, I like numbers, and uh, can you give? Uh, Amit, you said that uh, there are some injuries uh, that uh, is are very difficult to prevent, but in uh, in a ballpark what 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 would you say that uh, how many percentage of injuries can be prevented by the coaches f from the co coaches or officials unfortunately i cannot answer this question i i'm not very at the moment i'm not very familiar with the statistics because there every time a new study that comes out um it's very difficult for me to answer this question. Mm. It's a very, very difficult question, very ambitious question to ask. But maybe Michi can... Uh... Michael, give us uh, an exact percent, please. Yeah, um, exact. <laughs> <laughs> I think exact is also really, really difficult. And, it, and of course, it always depends on the level that you start already. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think there are studies that have that found out that hamstring injuries um, have increased by four percent every year since the early 2000s have increased increased yeah, yeah so, okay. the, so the the injury load gets higher and it's a really big problem for for all of the clubs um and especially when you play 50 or 60 games per per year per season um then of course the limiting factor is recovery time um, but then um, if you if you are if you are in a, in a different scenario where you have one game per week, um, may, then maybe the, the problem might be that you're not training enough. So you really have to look at this um, individually with every athlete, uh, with every team first, and then again with every athlete because every as a, as a, as a coaching staff you only see the athlete for two hours or three or four or five six hours depending on the on the level of the team per day. And what they do the rest of the day, you don't know. So I think educating the athlete um, is also a very, very important point in preventing injuries. Okay, so the education uh, for the athletes, and I understood from before you said that uh, I like I like the idea that uh, to avo to avoid uh, big jumps in training load because uh, uh, this. Uh, gives the situation to a player that he where he is not able to cope with the uh, load and uh, so so you would say that through the year the whole year uh, we should go step by step uh, always with every month we should try to add some load I think dollar load yeah I think you need you, there should be a it's called the, the, the term is called a periodization so that there should be phases of high uh, of high load, and then there should be phases of low load. I know from uh, from Basel that um, that, that was a, a, a many years ago. Um, somebody told me that the young players they don't grow during the year, and then when they're off for summer break, summer vacation, they have six weeks off. That's normally when they grow two to three centimeters. Um, hmm. So 
already there, you can see that the load for them is really, really high during the season when, when they're not growing, but then the body tries to catch up during the time off. So, you know, you should have breaks regarding the whole season, but also you should have breaks within uh, a shorter period of a season, so maybe a month. And then also you should have um, breaks within the week. So, you know, you have the game day, and then this is the most intensive day for the guy, for the player to play 90 minutes. And then after this, you should have two days where you don't train a lot. And then again, you can bring the, bring the load up. And then again, before the game, you bring the load down again. So you have like, it's called like waves undulating periodization. Okay. I guess, I guess you should uh, always find the right balance. Exactly. It's not uh, the higher, the better. Absolutely. You need all the time to find the right balance. And of course, the, the, the coaches should be very, um, very uh, with a lot of feeling for their players. So the feeling they're tired, they're not tired. He's tired, specific player. Maybe I will take him this week. I will give him a bit rest because he play uh, many games. You need to have this uh, fine feeling about uh, about your players, about your uh, your athlete. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, let's talk about the preseason, where uh, I see a lot uh, in Estonia. Uh, I see a lot of coaches who load a lot in that period, load more than uh, they do in the season. Uh, what would you say about that? Is it the right way to go, or uh, or the load should be there uh, continuously going up uh, as well? Um, I think it's, again, you, you cannot say like this, one way is better than, than the other. There's, in training, there's really a lot of different ways to get to reach the goal. Um, important is that you, in your system that you use, like, uh, like Amit said, I think the most, most, most important thing is the balance between loads and recovery. And when you when you have this in mind, um, and you go from that, you can create your training load uh, from that perspective. And there, you know, there is a term called functional overloading, that for a short period of time you can overload the athlete uh, to have an even better adaptation. But you can only do this when you have the time for the recovery after the functional overloading. So this is to your uh, to answer your question: if it's better to go. Uh, deeper in the beginning or to go step by step you can do both me personally i prefer the step by step approach because i i think once you're in a in a bad spot and you're in a really high load it's really difficult to go back normally because you don't have the time for the recovery so i rather step up easily and and every every new level that i try to achieve i i go slowly and i see the reactions of the players can they cope with the additional load and if not i go back immediately we must, we must also not forget which player you have in your team. There are, we, you have an older team, you have a younger player. It's, very, it's also very, very uh, it, can, it can change your, your way of working by the, by the asset that you have. Can I load them so high, so quickly? Or I need more time because they need longer recovery. So it's very um, dependent on the, on, the, on the players, on the athlete that you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will go to the to the differences of the athletes as well uh, in a bit. But um, I want to sum up uh, this topic a little bit uh, how I, how I understood it. Uh, Michael said in the end that uh, you should go step by step. Uh, Amit as well is uh, nodding his uh, head on that, and. Uh, then the question uh, arises for me again: If uh, if the season uh, starts from the January and ends in the November, then if we see the overall load in let's say in uh, March and compare it to let's say September, uh, then should the overall average load on the player be a little bit higher in the in September if everything goes right? and as planned or should it, should it be uh, basically the same as the season uh, from the beginning of the season to uh, the end of the season how would you answer uh, again 
to me that that depends on a lot of factors normally i would say you know during the competition period you should always be in a in a, in a system of balance um, when every game has the same value when the first game of the season gives the same amount of points like the last game of the season um, it might be different when you have a different uh, system of competition when uh, when you uh, have a playoff system and the goal for the first part of the season is only to qualify for the playoffs then i would not want to be in top shape in the first part of the season so again um that's one factor that it uh, depends on but, but normally like in football you you play uh however many rounds uh 30 rounds uh two times against uh, each team i think uh the form in march should be basically the same like the form in november or december Mm-hmm. Okay, Amit. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Michi, and it, his answer is fit to the to the former answer when he speak when he speaks of periodization. In the end, there is all the time up and down during during the during the season. So as 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 he said, I don't see any difference between the the first round and the second round. Absolutely, and you know during the season, you know you have the national team breaks. That maybe sometimes you can you can use as a as a, a time for a, a little bit of recovery to to become more fresh. Um, then for the players who go to national teams, uh, maybe after that they need a break, uh, or maybe you know you, you you change your starting 11s, your setup. You give it you give a player a break for one week, so you know you know during this like I mean like you said, so there's an up and down during all of the season. Um, And, and a good trainer has that in mind and, and rotates his players. So he, um, at all times, he has 11 players in top form and maybe some players who are right now at the moment recovering. But he knows he's giving them a break now and in two weeks he can use them again. But, but you know, now we're only speaking from the physical side. Um, of course, there's also the tactical consideration. There's the, the competition within the team of the players. So. You know, the, uh, I think in the end, the decision of what the trainer staff does cannot only uh, be based solely on, on the physical principle. That makes it even more difficult to program the training of a team. Mm -hmm. So a lot of variables in the periodization. Okay, uh, but to come back from, to, the, uh, to Amit's uh, job is the individualization of the... Uh, periodization as well so based on what should we determine the training load of the whole team is it based on the weakest based uh, uh, based on the strongest uh, or how do you see it because the question here comes to me that uh, uh, if we base it on the strongest then there probably will be a lot of a lot more injuries than uh, we would like to but based on the weakest then uh, we don't use the maximum adaptation uh, possibilities that's why the, that's why in the best the best uh, solution is to individualize the training for each player how he did for this for this you need a, a big infrastructure a lot of people a lot of a lot of data to work with but um, yeah i'm i'm always i'm all the time take the the midway the midway and the midway you can always push up if you start As I say, um, uh, central defender is not, uh, he, he has not uh, the same uh, ca character, uh, how do you say, he's not the same character as the right winger. And if uh, a player, uh, like a midfielder is uh, 36 years old, he's not, he has not uh, the same character as the 18 years old uh, striker. So it's very difficult to, um, to answer this question. So you take the midway? <sighs> This uh, maybe Michi, you can answer because I personally I don't work with the uh, with the healthy players, so you can you can you can help you can answer it much better than me. I so I think the the load should be based on the demand of the game in the end, and uh, then um, the the individualization can occur by how much of that load. Uh, a player does or by how much recovery um, a player gets in, in between so um, maybe if, if if as a trainer uh, you know today I say I want to play four times four minutes uh, five against five 
uh, and then maybe if I if I have a player who is not uh, ready for that load, um, I, I take him in as a joker or I only let him play three or four sets and take him out for, for the other sets. This is an easy way to um, individualize. But I think the training plan should be programmed on, on, on the needs of, of the starting players in the end to, to fulfill the demand of the, of the game. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying that still uh, individualiz individualization is the key uh, in there. Yes, but individualization um, easily done. Um, it has to be doable um, in the training. Uh, you know, and there's there's multiple ways. If you have the possibility to take one player out for one or two sets of four against four, then you do that. If you don't, you you let him play all of the five sets, and maybe for the next training on the following day, you take him out completely. So you know, you can you can always play with this um, a little bit to make it fit also the other demands and parameters of, uh, of the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you talk about this with the players uh, before the training or how do you communicate that? Okay, you see that the load is too high. Uh, do you just take him out and tell the coach or is it uh, does the player have a word in there? If he says like, okay, uh, I understand that the load to you looks looks uh, large and uh, big right now, but but for me, I feel that I can play. Or yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, really important to communicate, and it's difficult when you have uh, twenty five or thirty players to be able to communicate with with everyone. Um, but it, it should be done, and it should be communicated with the, with the head coach, with the fitness staff. Um, for me personally, um, that is one of the main reasons why I do the prevention program before the trainings. That is one form of, of, of communication. Um, I see the players do preventive exercises. Um, I, I see their faces. I see how they do the exercises. Uh, and from that, sometimes I can see if somebody is tired or not. Or even after, after training, I speak with them and I try already to, to define what is for, you know, when they're with a, so that's why the, the exchange with the physiotherapist is, is really important. When, when a player is uh, with Amit and, yeah, you know, he tells him this and this, we can speak together and we can adapt the load for the next day. Hmm. You mentioned your injury prevention program. few words about that. How, how does it look like? Uh, yes, of course, it's a, it's a program, 20 exercises uh, that we do before training. Um, it, it's, I, I hope and I think it's really demanding for the players. It's really focused on um, maximum range of motion to get control in the end range and to be able to produce power and force and contraction in the end ranges, um, get that control of the body and to prepare the, the body for the needs of the, of the game afterwards. Mm. So before every training, uh, all the players do these 20 exercises uh, that, uh, that challenge their bodies uh, in the full range of motion for the joints. And uh, to the, the goal is uh, to, uh, for them to understand how their body moves and to control the movements. Yes, exactly. And I think that the FIFA has also a program like this. It's called the FIFA 11 or uh, 11, 11 plus. plus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Amit, uh, last question. Uh, if there are zero injuries in your team, would you tell the head coach to increase the training loads? Uh, no. <laughs> and why is that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, because as I say, uh, more is not the better. Eh? It's it's about it's a, it's about it's about um, how do you say it? It's about your overview. Maybe now you don't have injuries, but maybe you did something right. So why not to continue with it? The more let's say it like this: the more load that you are doing, it doesn't mean that you take your player, make your player better. You need to you, you need to do it smart. Mm -hmm. And Michael. I totally agree with uh, Amit. So zero injuries uh, doesn't mean that uh, the optimal load is not uh, 
broth uh, into the team would you say no no i think uh also you know the load you determine it from from the performance in the game but but i would say if you're uh not fit enough if you're not capable to to play a game because you, you train not enough then you will have injuries as well so if, if you have zero in injuries it means that you probably are doing some things or even a lot of things pretty good mm -hmm. so it's uh, more like a compliment for you yeah uh, you could say it that way mm -hmm. yeah i will ask you a qu can i ask you a question yeah of course <laughs> Will you increase your load if your team is uh, losing all the time, not performing well in the games? Or will, or will you decrease the load when your team is winning? Yeah. Uh, personally, I would uh, keep these uh, things apart from each other, winning and losing. And uh, I would always focus on the, uh, the load uh, that, uh, is, that they can tolerate. And... Uh, Exactly. If, yeah, if they are uh, if they are uh, not injured and they can uh, tolerate the uh, load of the game, then there's no problem for me. Okay. Yeah, uh, but let's uh, sum up. Uh, what what is the most important point for us to take home from here, Michael? Can you start? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think. Uh, the goal is to prepare the players for the demands of the game. It means they have to do the, the, the movements, so the sprints, the distance of those sprints required, the duels, the accelerations, the decelerations, they have to practice this in training and they have to build up from where they are right now to where they want to go with the load. Um, and I think we have to educate uh, the players about um, training about um, recovery, about pain, about what they can do and what their responsibility is um, as well for the prevention of in injury. Because uh, so one sentence that I use, I say, I have like some sensors from the outside. I have my eyes to see. I have maybe the heart rate. I have the GPS data. But you have many million sensors inside of your body that tell you as well where you are and what what you should do and the better you can uh, interpret the information that your body sends you, the, the less likely you are to get injured. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amit? In my opinion, um, I, I I totally agree with Michi. Um, you know, in, in, in football clubs, I assume that uh, people uh, with knowledge are working there and they uh, know what they're doing. For that, I the 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 load and the trainings that I leave to them. I think communication is something very very important between the players, between the coaches, between the staff, between the physio and all the teams. This is very very important. And as Michi said, education because there is always something to do in order to prevent injuries. There is always uh, we can always try and uh, to 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 tell to educate the players about the, the sleeping quality, about the nutrition that they have about a prevention exercise that Michi spoke about, about uh, performing well uh, in the training and to be uh, correct with the subjective uh, answer about the, the intensity or about tiredness or about... Uh, because from my experience, many players, they don't, they're not, their answer is not really uh, clear because they are calculating, yeah, if I will say that I'm not tired or I'm tired, maybe it will not let me play the next game. In the end, they need to understand that this is for them. So education is something that it's very, very important, in my opinion. Mm. So you both brought out uh, education and the communication between the coaches and between the players and the coaches because uh, they, they, they will give you the feedback, what they feel and, and how big the load can be. So this was uh, our episode about training load and injuries. I'm really grateful uh, for your time, Amit and Michael. Our pleasure. Uh, see you in the next episodes. Bye. <laughs>